Welcome to the Ninja Entrepreneur Podcast, where we share the secrets to health, wealth, and being a kick-ass entrepreneur. Hey, what's up, guys? This is Joe for another episode of the Ninja Entrepreneur Podcast.com. Our featured guest today is Mr. Brennan Beliso. He's an impact speaker and author dedicated to helping people live their best life. Brennan Beliso is also an eighth degree black belt, a f- former recording artist with three top 10 hits in the Philippines, owner of the One Martial Arts in San Francisco, one of the most successful schools in the martial arts industry, and is the creator of the One Merit Badge system. Um, it's an internationally distributed life skills education program. Brendan humbly presents workshops and seminars with the mindset that we can always be and do better. He's committed to being a student for life, and he's a dedicated father, husband, and servant to the community. Brendan, really appreciate you doing this interview with us today. Hey, Joe. No, I'm really grateful to be here. Real grateful. Great. So um, I give the listeners a little bit of a background, but why don't you go and give your story on how you started your entrepreneurial business and well, I, mean, I, I fortunately was blessed to cut my teeth at an early age. Uh, I'm a third generation entrepreneur, small business owner. My grandmother owned restaurants, so I grew up in her restaurants serving, waiting tables, cleaning. Then my dad's owned a martial arts school for 44 years in the same location. So at a very early age, I recognized that you could determine your wealth, you can determine what you want to achieve in life um, if you did it on your own. You know, if you work for, as they say, working for the man, you're guaranteed a certain amount of money, a certain paycheck. You wake up 40 years from now with a gold watch and a pension and go, what the heck happened to my life? So I, I found that I didn't want to be at the mercy of those types of systems. So it was a natural fit at an early age. That's phenomenal. So you came from an entrepreneurial background. It was just in your blood, it sounds like. Absolutely. So there Absolutely. was no other choice, it sounded like. Um, I, I tried the corporate route. You know, in my early 20s, I worked for another company for a little bit. It was a big DJ company and I managed like 40 employees and we do hundreds of shows a month, weddings, bar mitzvahs, company parties, but that was short-lived for myself because I just, I, I had my own vision. I always, I was stubborn. I was stubborn as a kid yeah. and always the way I wanted to do things. And so it was short-lived. I've owned my own businesses since my mid-twenties. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So, you know, it sounds like, um, when you you had a bunch of different businesses, but now let's talk about your main one a little bit, the martial arts. You mentioned your father was part, had his own dojo as well. well yeah, I, I grew up in the martial arts. I started at the age of five. I trained six days a week, four hours a day, tournaments every other weekend. Our home was above the martial arts school. So again, something else that was always in my blood is the martial arts. It just I never saw it as a viable business from an entre- entrepreneurial viewpoint. You know, if you ask people like um, Michael Gerber, they'll tell you he's the e-myth guy. He will tell you that's the last industry you want to go into. The last industry you want to create a business for is the martial arts industry. Because across the board, I mean, we'll all verify that 85 to 90 percent are probably struggling with 100 students just getting by. So it was never a great business model. So what what changed you? What cha- what what switched you to actually pursue the career in the martial arts business? Well, at the time I was living in the Philippines and. The album, I had you know, I had three top ten hits, I had a number one song, and I, the album had exhausted itself. And I would come home every Christmas for a couple months and go back on tour. Two months home, then back on tour. Um, I was being offered another record deal. It was three albums in five years, and that's a lot. I mean, to produce three albums in five years, I was already on the road ten months out of the year. So I weighed that out, and I was home, and one late night I saw Tybo on TV. I said, wow, that's pretty cool. It's music, it's martial arts, it's dancing, it's DJing. So I thought it was really cool. So I decided to give up music. I came home. I was, you know, burned through all the money I made because I was just trying to figure out what I wanted to do next in life. And I'd made a good amount of money, so I was able to live for a while. I produced a uh, tape called The Next Level in Cardio Kickboxing, which did really well at Amazon. I hit the Tybo wave. I was teaching master's classes at all these big fitness conventions because it was an easy fit. But 
I also saw that my heart and soul had always been in the martial arts. I grew up in a martial arts school. I am a martial artist first and foremost, but from an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial mindset, I just never saw it as a viable model. But then I read Dan Kennedy. Now, I'm not big on Dan Kennedy's sales techniques because I'm not big on selling. But he did say, find out what your industry is doing and do the complete opposite. And I found that very profound. And, and so I sat about looking at our industry. Everybody had contracts, so I said no contracts. Everybody had a black belt club, so I said no black belt club. Everybody had belt testing fees, so I said no belt testing fees. So I sat about creating this anti-model just out of, I don't know, being rebellious. But my heart and soul has always been in service. My grandma taught me that. So if you take away all those trappings, contracts, and all that stuff, Joe, you know, you really have that service-based model. So I sat about developing that, writing the systems for it, and creating it, and now here we are. You know? That's phenomenal that you went against the grain, and you, you, it shows that you were successful. So. Yes, yes. Now, and, and there is a movement, like I said, Joe. There's people out there, John Cassidy, Top kick. They're on the East Coast. They have six, seven schools between them. You know, there's Randy Holman. There's a movement of people out there that are getting rid of contracts and doing amazing numbers. I mean, we just closed out 2014, a million ten thousand in in 3,700 square feet. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. We've done a million dollars every year for the past seven years without contracts, without all that stuff. So it does work. It really does work. And I believe at a heart level, you know, we're martial artists. We want to serve people. We don't want to sell them. It's not natural. It's not intuitive to our nature. No, that's phenomenal that you went against the grain. But I'm sure, like, you know, building this business of yours, and I never think we actually fail. It's always fail forwards. Was there any, at any point, would you say there was this biggest fail forward for you as you were learning this new business model or developing no, it? No, much like that movie, Apollo 13, failure is never an option. You know, people say this to me all the time. Everything you touch turns to gold. I said, no, it doesn't. I work really, really hard. I work hard. I love hard work. I'm not afraid of hard work. In fact, hard work inspires me. You know, some people love to work. I love to work hard. You know, in America, just the whole thing, you know, get rich quick. That's why Vegas makes so much money. All these things on TV, even some of the consultants in our industry. You know, I'll increase your bottom line by six figures in three months. That's so full of it. It's so full of it. everything we know is built through hard work, never giving up, and always doing your best. And through that, of course, you've got to have a very clear plan of action you know, with what you're doing. And, and, and if you can do those things, I truly, truly believe you will never fail. Like you say, failing forward because you're still moving forward. And every failure, to me, is an opportunity for course correction. It's an opportunity to learn and grow and better whatever it is. I'm not doing well enough. So I don't even think failure is, is a word I've ever used in my vocabulary. All right. It really reminds me of that uh, saying that success uh, comes to your door in overalls and looks like hard work. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, and, and that's it. Just we live in a culture where it's instant gratification, quick fix. You know, it's like in the Matrix when he plugged in the computer and they downloaded Kung Fu and he looks over and says, I know Kung Fu. You know, that's <laughs> not the way it is, right? But people found that so appealing because it appeals to that mindset of Western culture, which is get rich quick with very little work. Absolutely. Now, you know, it sounds like you've had a lot of success in your, in your business so far. Was there a point where there was this one great moment where you said things are rolling and I'm super happy with things, the way things are going? You know what it was? In 2011, and it's one of those aha moments, we did $1.1 $1 million. And I was speaking at a convention in Florida. And, and I, I, I told him what we made that year. And some little Vietnamese kid raised his hand and he said, how much did you make? I said, I made this much. He goes, do you realize that's $297 a square foot? I said, I have no idea what you're talking about, sir. And he said, that, that's a lot of money. That's considered, that's what retail uses. That's what restaurant uses as a formula. So then I, I sat about talking to this guy. They flew out to California, the top kick team, because they wanted to see how I was making 75% revenue on traditional classes. Well, the, the aha moment was when I flew out to their schools. They brought me out there to train their team. And while I was out there, this Vietnamese kid, two, his name's two, two lay, good buddy of mine. He takes me into one of his schools and he says to me, I haven't been in the school for three months. And I looked at him and I said, that's sacrilegious. We're martial artists. We're supposed to teach 80 hours a week on the floor every day, making a difference, having an impact. And he says, yeah, but that's not an entrepreneur. I said, what do you mean? You know, because as a singer, I did the singing. When I was a DJ, I did the DJing. So it's just natural. My grandma's restaurant, she cooked the food. So I just mm -hmm. always thought an entrepreneur was someone who worked in their business. So two really gave me that aha moment. 
that defining moment that where I sat about recognizing, you know, that I was in a very volatile position, even though I'm making all that money, that if I got sick or hurt, my business was tanked within a year. Mm -hmm. So that was a defining moment when I recognized, wow, you know, to be a true entrepreneur, you need to develop systems to teach people to do it better than you. Right. I completely agree that it's almost like, you know, our, our life becomes our business when, uh, when in, in essence, the business should support our lifestyle. Absolutely. Absolutely, Joe. I agree with that 150%. So after discovering that and now um, being as busy as you are, how do you find ways to stay healthy? Because I know as a martial artist, personally, I like to stay healthy. I like to keep practicing. What do you do? And this could be either workouts, nutrition, or both. You know, I think it's all of the above. I think it's creating a balance. When I'm on vacation, I'm going to eat a hamburger. I'm going to eat those freaking spare ribs. You know, and I see that over the holidays. A lot of my friends, I eat clean, but you're so pissed off over the holidays. The holidays are meant for that freaking slice of pumpkin pie. So it's first creating that balance, you know, and being okay with it. Second, I, I, I keep a life cycle at home. So even at the longest day when the kids go down to bed and my wife goes to bed about 10.30 or so, that, that bike looks at me and says, okay, what's your excuse now? What's your excuse now? So at least at the minimum, at the minimum, I'll climb on that bike and I'll do 45 minutes. I mean, it's not uncommon that I'm on it at 11, 11.30 at night. It's not uncommon at all. Good. At least you get it in. So this yeah. goes to my next question. Um, it, with your daily routine, what does the day in the life of Brennan Belisa look like? Well, it just varies. Today it was yelling and screaming at my daughter. That's what it was. <laughs> See you, baby. Go. Go. So today it was yelling and screaming at my daughter because she has a lot of tantrums and she's three years old. Um, right now it's been construction every day. You know, where we have this new location. We're putting in over 120000 just in renovations. And it's going to be state-of-the-art, really beautiful. I want to set, again, set another benchmark for our industry of what a school should look like. You know, not some fitness boutique, a martial arts school that caters to kids. Huge difference. You know, we all have this vision of what we want to make our schools look like, and they end up looking like some nightclub. And remember, if we cater to kids, I don't think that's a good fit. You know, so we got the baby changing table in, in, in the bathroom. But most days, typically, I like to get up in the morning. I take my son to school. We have breakfast together. It's very important. That family time is very important. You, you've got a baby coming, right, Joe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Soon. Soon. A couple mm -hmm. months. Your life will change. First, you will never sleep. Get used to that. It's going to oh, change yeah. completely. And your purpose will be redefined. Are you going to have a boy or a girl? It's a boy. Yeah. There you go. Your purpose is going to be redefined. So I take my son to school. Then I, I go down to Pete's Coffee. And I will literally sit for two to three hours writing systems or doing interviews like this or doing webinars online or helping people in our industry. People know me across the board. I don't charge them a cent. I help a lot of people in our industry. I believe in paying it forward. I believe in affecting change. So other than writing those systems in that three-hour period, I like to set at least an hour aside a day to help people. I, that's really important. Then after that, I pick up my son from school. I come home. I'll work on more projects. I'm only working five to ten hours a week in the current location. So it's not like I have to go in all the time. So I spend a lot of time writing, developing you know, more products for one merit badge. I just finished a great thing called Excellent Kids, which is an amazing preschool system. You know, we're going to launch it. We just had to get a few copyrights and lawyer things tightened up. But it's a great educational system for preschool. So that's what I do. I'm a creator. I love to create. I love to write. Um, all those things are important. And, you know, it sounds, it's, it's really interesting with daily routines that, you know, you need that time to sharpen your own sword. And it's amazing to hear that family time is that time that you cherish the most and it actually reinvigorates you almost like does it, it inspires you to work harder it sounds like well it does it gives me purpose it really gives me purpose just like the second location I had no intention on opening a second location you know me and Roland Osborne are really good buddies and we talk a lot about affecting change worldwide you can't do that within a five mile radius of a, of a school you can't so I was only gonna keep this one school because I'm making great money I live in a million dollar home my kids go to you know the best schools we eat the best foods we take whatever vacations we want and so life is good. But I recognize to provide my team with opportunities, I also want them to have medical benefits. I couldn't do that with one location. So I'm going to step up and start teaching again, you know, 20, 30 hours a week, building another team, building another school, because I want my team to be successful. Because my team is an extension of my family. And I treat my team like gold. We have 401ks. We have vacation with pay. They get paid well. I respect their time outside of my school. You know, and I give them a lot of creative leeway to have their own input in growing our culture. 
So those those are those more than my even well not more than my family but with equally, you know my, my team is just as important. Yeah, that's phenomenal. It's like, like you know you know if you treat your team well, they'll just treat your clients well. Well, yeah, dreams aren't achieved alone. I mean, it takes people to help your dreams come true. So when we start believing our own hype and we get in that position, Joe, where it's I, 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 and we're saying me, 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 that's a very dangerous place to be. And you'll watch that. Any great leader will never use the word I or me. A great leader will always say we. Mm -hmm. We. Listen to some of the great TED Talks out there. All these CEOs, these head guys, they're always referring to we, the team, us, never I or me. I'd be very scary if somebody, if they always referred to themselves as I and me. Absolutely agree. Now, you know, I know as entrepreneurs, we're always looking for that slight edge. And uh, I always have that shiny object syndrome, especially when it comes to resources and books. So my question to you, is there three books that you're currently reading right now? Um, I just finished rereading The Tipping Point. Have you read that book? The Tipping That's a good one, Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah, it's, it's super. You know, the big thing I'm gathering from that word of mouth is still the most powerful. So people should spend a lot of time, not necessarily money, a lot of time and effort in making sure their brand, their culture is something people talk about in a good way. You know, it's right. easy for our egos to dismiss it and say, oh, they're all haters. They're haters because I'm successful. They're haters. But you know what? There might be a little bit of truth in there if we just check our ego. So the tipping point really reminded me of that, that this word of mouth out of all the marketing is still the most powerful and that two kids in the East Village can wear a pair of hush puppies and revive the whole industry for hush puppy. I mean, it's amazing, right? That was it's, a great story. It's like the butterfly effect. Um, I also just finished reading Mastery. Mastery is a really good book. And it just, you Robert know, Green? Is it Robert Green? What are your laws of power? Yeah, it's sitting on my bike. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that one taught me again to always work hard, to never give up, to have, be very clear on my values, be very clear on my vision, you know, where I want to be in three to five years. And you know, just, it, to me, mastery is like a martial arts book. It mm -hmm. just talks about all the values we learn as martial artists. And then I recommend to everybody, read The E-Myth Revisited. The E-Myth Revisited is powerful. It's what taught me that systems are the key to building a business that's not dependent upon you being there. But you have to check your ego and create systems where people do it better than you. But in the martial arts industry, we're afraid the guy's going to leave me and open up down the street and take out my students. If you live in fear, you're always going to fall short. So I choose to live from love. And love is unconditional. And hey, if somebody chooses to leave and want to do that, more power to them. More power to them. That's not going to stop me from training a team, a high-performance team, to do it better than me. I also recommend Delivering Happiness by Tony Shea. He's the Zappos guy. An awesome book, right? He really taught me about culture. Invest in the culture. He said, we don't sell shoes. We're in the business of customer service. I love it because I'm a very service-oriented person. I get that. That resonates with me you know, tenfold. And then last but not least, I would encourage everybody to read Good to Great by Jim Collins. Because it's statistical, right? It's scientific, statistical research proving that no matter what company it is, 100 years old, Facebook, a decade old, it makes no difference what business trends come and go and change. The one thing that will never change are your core values. So whatever mm -hmm. those core values are, integrity, you know, gratitude, whatever they may be, no matter what happens, you don't veer from those values. Because at the end of the day, Joe, when we lay our head down on the pillow, we have to be cool with what we did. You brought up so many good points there, I think. You know, one of the things with uh, our industry, I think it's plagued with scarcity-minded people that don't believe yes. that there's abundant amount of uh, resources and people that need our help, which is, which is awesome. But see, what that comes from, Joe, Roland says this all the time, you know, he says, we are an industry that is drowning in knowledge and starving for wisdom. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? And what that basically comes down to is, like I'm saying, you need to be very clear on your values first. Second, what is your vision? What do you want your life to look like in three to five years? But third, and probably more important, is what is your purpose? Because that purpose defines the why. Why do I want to come to your martial arts school versus Joe Karate down the street? Why? And it is that why. And if you regurgitate the same industry propaganda that's been circulating since the 1980s, we teach focus, discipline, you know, the same thing. You have to say it in a unique way. You have to say it in a way that makes people go, that's why I want to be there. So many phenomenal truth bombs. <laughs> okay. This next question, though, is a fun one because I honestly believe that everybody's life is like a kung fu or action movie where you get beat up, you got that training montage to bring yourself up, and then you come back and kick everybody's butts. 
Uh, Brennan, do you have a favorite Kung Fu action movie and why? You know, I, I'm a martial arts movie junkie, so I can run across the board. I just watched The Raid 2 again. I like The Raid. The first one was awesome. You know, I loved Tony Jaws, the first one uh, when, when he did Ong Bak. I love Donnie Yen, all the Ip Man movies. Oh, my God. But honestly, all, all-time favorite will always have to be Bruce Lee. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Bruce Lee was the, always the underdog, and he didn't take any prisoners, and he came out and tried to do the right thing, and people pushed him, and, you know, in the end, his creativity and individuality had to shine. But the most profound line from that movie that resonates with my business, you know, when that guy asked him, what's your style? And Bruce Lee said, it's the art of fighting without fighting. People say that to me all the time. You're the art of selling without selling. They walk into my school, they observe what we do, and they say, you guys sell all the time through service. I said, that's what I've been trying to say. Stop selling and start serving, and you will sell all day long. That is deep. That is deep. Love that. So the next question is about like mantras and self-affirmations. You know, I always believe in, you know, there's always this internal voice going on in our head. Is there one mantra or quote that you know, gets you fired up every single time you hear it or say it? Yep, it's not about me, it's about we. It's not about me, but we. I'm reminded every day that it's never about me. It's, you know, it's got to be about we, my family, my team, the community. If I live from that viewpoint constantly, then I don't get caught up in my own hype. It's very easy when you start becoming what they call a leader in the industry, whatever you want. I mean, to me, it's like when I grew up, it was Sensei and Sifu. Now there's Grandmaster and Super Grandmaster and Big Grandmaster. I mean, what are we, rap groups or the KKK? I don't know, man. You know, when I grew up, it was Sensei and Sifu. It was a very humble state. So I'm ever mindful if I always say, it's not about me, but we. I'm constantly checking my ego. Because we're all human beings. We suffer from that condition of ego. So if I can always check that and have a sense of humility. So any mantra that promotes humility, that promotes community, you know, to keep you in check will always keep your heart and mind open to doing the right thing, to fulfilling that purpose. I think uh, it's, it's huge that you just talk about community so much. And I think that's what's important. All, all of us just finding our tribe that we can relate with and, uh, and uh, just, just be part of. Now, for those that want to reach out to you and learn a little bit more about you, what is the best way to, uh, to get at you? Take your pick. Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram. And I use all forms of social media, but you know, somebody posted and, and and I want to throw this in there, and, and then I'll give you a couple of contact numbers, Joe. You know, they said, ah, forget these school talks. Don't sit there at these fairs and stuff. What a waste of time. You should just be on Facebook, Facebook ads, SEO optimization, blah blah blah. And yeah, you have to utilize that, but nothing beats FaceTime. Nothing beats you standing in the community picking up a broom and sweeping or 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 being at a walkathon and donating your time, you know, those different things, nothing will ever defeat that. And so for people to be so blind and think technology is the only way that's going to rule marketing, I think that's very poor judgment. Very poor judgment. Thus, is why I tell people if you want to get a hold of me, you know, if you reach out at Facebook, I'll give you my number. We'll talk face to face. Whether it's Skype or via the phone, I just find the texting and all that stuff, there is a bit of a disconnect. And that's lost in our culture. That art of looking each other in the eye and really sharing your heart with somebody on a very passionate level, it's lost because of technology. So we need to create that balance. So find me at Facebook, definitely. You can email me at professor at onemartialarts.com as, as well as you can find me at brandonbeliso.com too. Honestly, Brandon, I really felt the passion through this. Like, I mean, reading your stuff and then listening to it, it's completely different. You're absolutely right about the FaceTime. It is super important. And you know what? Thank you for sharing your secrets on health, wealth, and being a kick-ass entrepreneur. No, it's an honor, Joe. You know, have a good one. I've been watching what you're doing, sir, and it's brilliant. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Have a good one. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Ninja Entrepreneur Podcast. To get all the show notes, head over to www.theninjaentrepreneur.com and be sure to download our free report on 7 Habits of Highly Effective Ninjapreneurs. See you soon.